from the home of creative writing on the internet. The future starts right now. I made a reservation, but you never came, so I'm checking out. The fire stole away. I know one day we'll come back around. The future is now. Here's your host, Peter Cox. Yeah, hello. The future is now. Happy New Year to you. Let me wish you a surprisingly good year. I hope it's brilliant for you. Wherever you are, whatever you're up to. Um, first show of the year, you're going to see a lot of changes this year to pop up submissions. Hopefully, bigger and better. Just one thing I would ask you, please, right at the beginning of the show. Um, Tell your friends about it. Spread the word about pop-up submissions. The algorithms on YouTube have changed a little bit, and sometimes we have content that kind of, you know, makes us a little bit risque, and uh, we don't get uh, promoted in the way that YouTube does promote other videos. So it's really up to you. If you think we're doing a good thing, then please spread the word. Oh, my goodness, look who it is. First guest of the new year. It's the Grand Dame of Antipodean apprehension herself. <laughs> yes, Lee Murray. From the other end of the earth. He's dapper. He's debonair. He's definitely Annie Dickinson. Hello, Lee. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Yeah, and you're looking happy, relaxed, tanned, fit and ready, as you would do, of course, living in New Zealand, you lucky thing, you. Yes, we did see the new year in first, and um, it's, uh, yeah, we've, it's the summer, so uh, unfortunately it's raining today, it's a bit of a bummer, oh, <laughs> but I, I, it's actually awful. daytime. I can't imagine that, <laughs> rain in New Zealand, you poor thing. <laughs> oh, my heart goes out to you. Oh, dear. Um, give us a book recommendation, the very first one of the new year, if you would. Um, I would like to recommend a book called Revelation from the Poppet Cycle, which is a new series by Donna J.W. Munro, lovely lady. Um, this is an incredible dystopian series about uh, hmm, <laughs> about harvesting the dead to use as, serv to use as servants. Which Sounds you know, a good idea, yes. I, I can see that life. happening very soon, yes. <laughs> I can't even get my live family to do, to do things around home, so I don't know how you get this dead ones to do anything but, in this, but it is incredibly dark it's a, it's a story for teens um, it's a little bit kind of your your Hunger Games type of trilogy and um, this is the first book in the series really great but what I really liked was the sort of study of privilege and how if you're born into privilege you don't mm. necessarily understand that privilege so mm. um, exceptionally well written I really enjoyed it really wanted to get your teeth into so fantastic great recommendation yeah. yeah thank great. you very much Lee yeah. terrific let's see Let's see what Andy's got for us. You got a book for us, Andy? Yes, I have. Um, Maggot Moon. Um, this is ostensibly, I think it's a young adult novel, but it's it's quite unique, actually. I've read quite a lot of young adult and kids' books, seeing as that's what I tend to write myself. But yeah. this really is quite, quite special. It's quite dark. Um, it, I What's really it like? If, if you like something else, what would, would you like this? What's it kind of, you know, like? Well, I guess I guess it's a little bit Neil Gaiman esque, I suppose. Oh, okay. In some yeah, it's, great. Um, the the plot kind of revolves a little bit around like the Jewish experience in World War Two and oh, the fantastic. A very very good recommendation there. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, Make a priority let's... submission at priority.latopia.com. Absolutely, we're ready and waiting for you, priority submitters. Please help us out. We charge a little bit of money for a priority submission. Your ordinary submissions are free, um, and that does help us a lot. Um, let's have a look and see what happened. I was going to say last week, last year. Wow. Yeah. This is what we saw. It was a very good show. It was neck and neck, if you recall, with our guests, Tex Thompson and Dean Baxter. 80% um, of the live vote went to Michelle's satirical serial killer thriller. I love that genre. I think she invented that all by herself. It's brilliant. Um, How to Dig Your Own Grave and 75% of the vote. So it really was close. Going to Georgina Key's women's fiction mystery, Pemberton Manor. But what happened in the, what, two weeks since then? How did you vote? Let's have a look. I'll show you.
Well done. Yeah, well done, Georgina. It wasn't quite so close with the popular vote. Actually, I can tell you that Georgina got 55% of the popular vote. 35% went to Michelle's work, but they're both bloody good works. Let's see what's first up this year. And this is from Simon. And Simon, I think he's watching us on YouTube, actually. He's been sending nervous uh, messages out there. Um, as you should do, Simon. Oh, my God. I'm on pop-up submissions. It's speculative fiction. It's called An Allodyne Touch. And this is Simon's blurb. On the eve of the great relocation, the Neurolink is unveiled, a virtual reality network that connects directly to the brain. At first, people thought it was a wondrous invention, generating myriad worlds at the touch of a button. Then, they discovered it had a defect. If they touched anything while they were on it, it made them sick. A few developed more extreme reactions. Some went mad and disappeared. They called it allodynia. Allodynia. Um, let me tell you about Simon. I write for an online magazine, says Simon about anything from property prices to architecture and design. The book is part of the Disconnect Parallels, three stories about social disconnection. Okay, so it's, it's non-fiction then. <laughs> uh, fantastic. We have, uh, we have Jeff to kick off the year for us with your work, Simon. An Aladdin Touch by Simon, read by Jeff. The world closed in on itself, sucking everything into its swirling core till all that remained was a single point of light that flickered and went out. Several moments passed. Lucas blinked, opened his eyes. Something about the disconnect hadn't felt right. He had a sharp pain in his abdomen. He reached down, probing for clues. A twitch. Another. Then the spasms hit, one after the other in quick succession, his back arching, his arms flailing. After the final one, he ripped off his headset, shot forward and vomited a jet of acrid juices across the floor. Lucas wiped the residue from his mouth, slumped back into the giant Neuralink chair. Jesus, no! He'd been convinced it wouldn't happen to him, but now he'd taken one trip too many, triggering the onset of his allodynia and shattering his delusion. He'd watched a handful of his friends suffer a similar fate. He could still remember their anxious expressions as they struggled to cope with their every increasing nausea. How he tried and failed to help. Mostly, he remembered his sense of loss when, one after the other, they disappeared from the Neuralink. How could I have been so stupid? Lucas banged his fist down in frustration. In the silence that followed, he gathered his strength, heaved himself out of the chair and got a bucket from the cupboard. Dropping it into the sink, he opened the tap and gazed out of the window. His noise was easing, but his mind was numb. None of it seemed real, a waking dream he couldn't shake. The water kept on pouring, reaching the top of the bucket, cascading over the sides and filling the small sink. Only when it began flooding the floor did Lucas notice and turn it off. He surveyed the growing lake and, with a grunt, grabbed his mop and began sweeping it back and forth. The clean-up felt like it would go on forever, but as he squeezed out the last drops of dirty water, an alarm sounded. A blast of cold air shot out of the living room ducts and the front door swung open. Gardening time had begun. The cold was shocking. All around the clearing, a vast sea of pine trees swayed in the biting wind. With his coat reduced to rags and only a thin pair of cotton overalls for protection, Lucas took a deep breath, put his arms tight against his chain and walked a little faster. Clinging to the comfort of old rituals, he counted the steps to the two greenhouses on the far side of his plot. 82 to the first turn, 150 to the second, a sharp left and right, taking care to avoid the fallen tree. 19 to the end, a journey he liked to tell his friends he'd once made, inch perfect, eyes closed. Ahead, at the entrance to the first greenhouse, his robin was waiting, its bright red breast, a welcome splash of colour in the endless grey light. Lucas whistled the greeting, and the little bird fluttered up and down. When he opened the door, it came with him, and they stood together, savouring the warmth, as the fluorescent tubes flickered into life. With the lights on, his spirits lifted. Overnight, hundreds of fresh green shoots had burst through the topsoil. Your crops are your priority, the relocation pack had advised, and he took pride in their care. Setting off down the small aisle, Lucas tended to his plants. 
his little companion falling close behind, scratching and pecking at the freshly turned soil. There were plenty of jobs in his list, but progress was slow, and he kept slipping further and further behind the schedule. Tutting an admonishment, he gathered up some pots and got to his feet. As he did so, he had the sudden sensation the ground was moving beneath him. Tilting on some unseen axis, small explosions of light went off in his eyes, and he swayed back and forward like a drunk. A thought flashed through his mind. Is this it? Was that so terrifying? For an instant, the world turned black. And down he went. Uh oh, never a good sign that. And and he's disappeared. <laughs> I love this. I think he's gone. To, I, I think, I think he's gone to see the cats. I do. So that held your attention, then, did it, Andy? My neighbour just turned up with one of the cats. That's live television for you, isn't it? How oh exciting. my god! Is, is is the cat all right? She's all right. She just wants a, di- a dinner now. Yeah. Oh, if it's not one thing, it's another, right? Eh? Um, let's just have a look and see what the. Oh, hello. Who who are we talking to? This is Phoebe. Oh, Phoebe, sweetie Happy pie, New Year. sweetie Happy pie. New Year, god, yeah. Maybe we should do a little work now. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> Oh dear, it's going to go downhill, I can tell. Um, so, Barbara says something I kind of resonate with uh, in the chat room. She said, I don't know much about him yet, though. I'd like to know who he is. I kind of felt yeah. that. Pace is good, says Vicky. And Cora Amparo, yeah, we need to care for the character. My, uh, by the way, can I just say, Jeff, thank you for fantastic reading. All yeah. our readers are fantastic, of course, but you, you know, I mean, they put their heart and soul into it, and I just want to make sure that they're fully acknowledged. Thank you, Jeff. That's really great. Um, nothing to set it apart, says Johnny, from similar in the genre so far. Victoria says, I need to know more about this problem in this world, beside you vomit when making the wrong move. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's, uh, let's get some expert advice here, Lee. What were your reactions? Yeah, I think Victoria hit the nail on the head too. Um, you know, great vomitous beginning and lots <laughs> of action, but we don't know we don't know why. So the magic is a little bit missing. We don't really have an understanding of what the stakes are here and and who he is. As you say, we sort of don't really have a, a real perception. And we had that that wonderful line, you know, it's something or other time for gardening. Oh, gardening time had begun, and I thought, oh yes, yeah, we're going nice. straight into horror. This is fantastic, yes. and then it was gardening. <laughs> And, and I, I wanted something a little bit more momentous than the gardening. I had thought that this yeah. was this was the clue. And it's a metaphor so, for something and, horrible. No, it's really gardening. Yes. It's really gardening. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's actually yeah. gardening. And I thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, so I think perhaps the world building could needs to be incorporated in that first um, in that first paragraph, that first section more, yeah. so we have a bit more of an understanding of what the concept is. Yeah. Um, in order, the writing is fine, a little bit filtered at the beginning, but otherwise pretty good. So yeah. if we just had that magic, I think we would be right on board. Okay, fantastic. Uh, let's get a number from you then, one to five. Oh, what, which way does it go? Uh, remind me. Which well, is one is and which awful. Is... One is really seriously awful. It's like, do not, you know, do not cross my threshold anymore. Take it from the side of my eyes. Five is, I want, I want, to, I want to marry this manuscript and have his babies. Oh, mm, somewhere between three and four at the moment, because I'm really not sure what the story is about. Okay. You can't go for three and a half. Oh, dear. Uh, give it a four, then. Go on. Oh! <laughs> okay. Oh, I gave me a heart attack then. I thought we were going to say three, <laughs> four. That's a that's a darn good start, Lee Murray. Thank you. Oh, Andy. it's New Year. <laughs> it is absolutely. Everyone's everyone's feeling pretty weird, really. Um, so, from what little you managed to to see of of that manuscript that Phoebe allowed you to see, Andy, what do you think? Um, I've I had a lot of sympathy for this. I have to say, um, speculative fiction. I'm not that keen on. It's, it's that science fiction what? to me. Well, it's science fiction, isn't it? Well, why would you mess with, with, with such a classic genre heading? I'm just going to sit back and let them fight, folks. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't see why you need to make it speculative fiction when it's science fiction. But yeah. I, I like the verb. Um, I thought it was good. I thought it was cogent. I thought when, when it 
Blurb said sick. That felt a bit weak, but otherwise I thought the blurb worked very well. Yeah. I thought we had a great uh, opening sentence and we were straight into the action. It was really nicely written. Um, no fuss, which is exactly what I like. When we got to the garden dimensions, yeah, like you guys, a little bit, oh, okay. Um, I, I think yeah. the argument about what we know of the main character was definitely lacking. We weren't really given in classic pink talk uh, a reason to care particularly yeah that's um, right so that, that worried me. i like the uh, the juxtaposition between the robin and the fluorescent tubes um and it ended quite well so. he was paying attention he was or maybe he phoebe was. was watching and he's just just relayed her comments telepathically let's get a number andy so um i i feel exactly the same as lee i would have gone for a three and a half so she as soon as she's gone for a four i'll even out and give it a three three yeah yeah, I, I can't add any more to that expert comment. I'm going to go for three as well. Still a pretty good start, Simon, actually. I mean, people have won with, with scores like that. So, um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm right off, Andy. What you know, speculative <laughs> fiction is my genre, and um, I don't know this whole you know, like, let's just narrow it down. <laughs> I, love I love it, I love it when they fight. It's one I've never had this before. I'm just gonna sit back and let them duke it out, you know. No, I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to move on to the next one, which is No More Dragons. No More Dragons, can't believe that. It's fantasy by Cameron. This is Cameron's blurb. Oh, and by the way, there's a QR code there too if you wonder what that's doing. Uh, you scan it and you will go to wherever Cameron wants you to go to. I always like that. I think it's a bit of fun. He could be sending you anywhere off the, on the internet at all to Mystery Tour. Scan it on your phone. You will see them popping up during the show. And uh, if you get bored or something, you just yeah, scan it and see. In No More Dragons, 96,015 words, writes Cameron. A novel which poses the question, what if the American and French revolutions happened in a fantasy world? The mysterious disappearance of dragons sets off a revolution in the kingdoms of Franor and Kayanal. The novel is told by a series of historical narrators who lived through and helped to shape the revolutionary events, primarily Jacques Basque, a young, high-class, noble or romantic. Mine off to mine heart. Um, let me tell you about Cameron. It's short and sharp, sweet to the point. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Fine. Now we know. Thank you, Cameron. Um, we need uh, we need a high-powered reading for this, I think. Yes? Do you agree? Call for Kate. The first page. Life Paper by Deborah Cooper. No More Dragons by Cameron. Read by Kate. One. Scribe Historian I, editor of this book, a historian, write an introduction and provide my own tangential thoughts. Imperfect young men and women sought to make better a cruel world. You may think you know them. As you read their words written by their own hands, which I have found and here gathered, edited and compiled in this book, you may find yourself surprised that their characters do not match your preconceived notions which have been passed down and amplified as myths taught in classrooms. I left out most of the more famous passages and slogans found in pamphlets of the revolutionary era which have become widely familiar. I instead sought to compile more obscure material. Some names you read of in the following pages may be new to you, even as you will recognise many of the names which are famous. I ask as you read that you remind yourself of how unsure these young revolutionaries were of their chances of success and failure as they began to seek to topple the prevailing world order. The inertia of the status quo always feels as locked in universal natural law as gravity and dragons, that is, when there used to be dragons. As you of course know, there are no more dragons, just as there are no more other types of ancient beasts which have either become extinct or clogs in evolution which resulted in the animals we see today made to adapt to their environments. Society and science progress forwards, or at least they should. 
the old ways of ruling cruel and dumb kings who made laws and decrees which only further enriched and benefited themselves and their rich elite cronies worked as a blockage to advancements in society, general well-being, happiness and welfare of the populace and scientific discoveries. This was true in all of the major kingdoms of the continent, Franal, Chayanal, Gar and Urk. The young revolutionaries may have not fully known that their desire for a more just and fair existence for all the people would also result in scientific breakthroughs, yet it did. And thus we see how history, society, progress and science are so tightly intertwined. I hope that the reader will keep in mind how fluid our own history in our own time is. Just as nothing remained certain while history unfolded in the past, so is it that nothing is certain as history unfolds currently. We can regress even as progress is sought and either achieved or denied. There may no longer be ruling kings and queens, yet those in power still seek king-like powers in order to enrich themselves and their elite friends above all else. Societies, laws, norms and culture may sway and move in the direction of justice and progress if enough brave people seek to bend it that way, yet individual selfish human nature remains stubborn. As we see, history is not dead, rather history is a part of us, for it is how we got to where we are. History is as an animal that did not become extinct, but rather has evolved into the animal which we currently live with, which has adapted to fit its environment. The past bleeds into the present, and our present will bleed into the future. The young revolutionaries at the time of the revolutionary era here documented were unsure of their likelihood of failure or success, just as we are unsure now if the freedoms and benefits of society they so sought, fought and died for will prevail. One day there were dragons, and then on another day there were no more dragons. New light ushered in new understandings and a thirst for a more logical and equitable existence for all. The days of dragons ended abruptly and then followed the fall of monarchical rule. Enlightenment replaced illogic. The fire of revolution spread and consumed all until all was remade like char turned into crystal. I reiterate that it always feels as though the world as it currently is, is the world which destiny preordained that it would be as. I reiterate again that we must be mindful that this is not so. Yeah, so now you've got, um, Cameron, you've got lots and lots of helpful comments from the genius room. So many that they've actually scrolled off the top, actually. Um, and uh, I, I understand all of them. I'm resonating with all of them, actually. You need to um, you need to just stop the video at this point. If you're not joining us live and if you haven't seen all the comments, just stop the video now and just read back through the ones that you can see on the screen. But unfortunately, a lot of the really good ones too have scrolled off the top. Um, yeah, just picking up one at random because there's so many good comments here. That's why we call it the genius room. Uh, Rachel yeah. says, if this was mine and, uh, and wanted an info dump in the form of encyclopedia entry, I'd actually put in in the book um, as a clipping from 18th, 19th century encyclopedia illustrations and all. Yeah, that's a good idea. Ay, ay, ay. Where do we go? What do we make of this, Andy? Oh, thank you. Um, no more dragons. The title's fine. Um, the blurb for me wasn't quite written as a blurb. Um, it's an interesting concept, you know, dragons, the fantasy version of revolutions, yeah, why not? But straight away, I think you look at that text and you think, well, this needs some punctuation. I don't think I saw a comma in it. No. Um, and then you get the voice of a historian, which is fine ostensibly. But the problem for me is, after a while, it feels like a lecture. Yeah. And there was some nice language in it, but I just felt so removed. Yeah. And after a while, it went from, okay, this is dry, to like, I feel lectured to the point of switching off, and I'm getting a bit yeah. annoyed. 
So, yeah, and, I, you know, I, yeah. I think Cameron, I think you can write. There's some really yeah, I nice agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but but I, I just this isn't the way to engage me personally. So so yeah. No, it's not the way to engage the reader. Um, I agree. I, I find myself drifting off as well, which is not not great. But then I came back and yeah, you know, I noticed some. You know, I just picked on some really nice sentences too. So I think you can do it, Cameron. But um, you know, there are one or two nuggets of gold here, definitely. Um, I mean, when, when you started addressing the reader directly, I thought that was very impressive, actually. I thought that worked really well, uh, just from memory. Um, reader doesn't normally expect that, you know, two, three pages into a book. And if you just do it straight out, it makes them go, oh, he's talking to me, um, which can be good. Um, it, it parts of it were really clunky. And it's not a question to oh, I need some editing. It, it actually needs, you know, this feels first draft. So it's up to you. It's not up to the editor to um to to make that to, to to bring it to the next stage before any editor can really get their hands on it parts of it felt a bit like the unabomber manifesto um i just want to go oh please don't um and the thing that uh, just a very very small point it's hardly worth mentioning but i go to any case you sent the whole manuscript um and that th what that indicates is you don't know what, really when when to cut it off and it also indicates you don't really listen to the instructions you give them um and if you if you send that sort of message to you know to publishers or agents i'm an agent uh, but i can speak on behalf of almost all agents and all publishers on this if you don't listen to what, what they ask for and we only ask 700 words then it's a bit like oh, i send out see what's six on the wall and you know we have the same attitude then really we, we, you know, how can you expect us to be keen on something if you know you don't pay attention to it yourself so that's just my little you know hobby horse but i think it's significant e uh, lee your reactions yeah well okay for a, for an alternate history this is quite common i think in fantasy fiction where you know you start with a you start with a narrator who's slightly flawed um, Alessia Ponder did a really good job of it in her Silvala Chronicles, she also involving dragons. Um, it's YA, sort of a bit um, for precocious re young readers. But the, but the idea there is to sort of have a slightly flawed narrator who's telling the story, who gives you the context. Um, and it's really a fun way because you know that that it's not quite the story um and and i liked the voice was kind of pompous and um disdainful historian so we did get that that feel so i think that has potential i mean dracula was very successful and done in this way when you have the yeah. different people um telling the, telling the story through different types of text and i think that that can really work and i think that fantasy readers are willing to invest a little bit more in it they like a yeah, chunky tome you know? they are yeah yeah so, i know what you mean so yeah. there is potential for this but i agree that it needed an edit and it was it just went on over too long um you know uh, you know it's important that the that the that the narrator has a character i think in this case but it just went right. a little bit too long into the dry balls historian kind of thing. And yeah. so if we chopped it in half, maybe took out the tagline where it says, I'm going to tell you this stuff. Yeah. Because I don't think we need that. I think it yeah. said, you know, my tangential thoughts. We don't care. You know, you, historians going to put their footnotes in the bottom. Put the footnotes in the bottom. So we, That's right. so we see them. So it looks like a historical account. And yeah. I think, so I think there's potential, but it's just not there quite yeah. yet and also yeah. dragon fiction oh my gosh it's just huge at the moment a friend of mine yeah. is uh, writes Ali Mueller writes dragon fiction and she's making a very nice living from it thank you very much so there are definitely readers who want to be reading this stuff so I think you're on to something it's just it's just not quite there yet I love so, dragon fiction um, yeah. yeah is it is it is yeah. it going is, where are they where are they going you know more than i do about this where are they going with dragon fiction is it getting you know i mean is the dragon sex and stuff no I, well i i can't say i've read any with dragon sex to be oh, honest fine, that's just fine. i just home. wanted to know <laughs> just asking that's all i'm sure there's a niche somewhere there <laughs> but, i just wonder how um, they do it i don't know all right now fine <laughs> uh, give us a number lee give us a number Oh, that is really hard. That is really hard. I'm going to have to go four again, I think. Because really? I just, it's, yeah. Wow. It's the gin and tonic talking. Gosh. It must be. That, that's, that's incredibly positive and encouraging. 
Uh, just read out Robert's uh, comment from the chat room. This writer clearly really knows their world. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that this helped to write themselves in. But it just needs to be cut in entirety and start where the story starts. Yes. Andy, numbers, please. Well, now I've finished uh, choking on my tea when, after you randomly brought in a uh, dragon <laughs> set. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to get a two, I'm afraid. Two. Yeah. I, I felt that coming up. I could feel this like like a cat with a fur ball. Like, just, it's a two. Me as well. Me as well. Yeah. Uh, chat room's on fire. I mean, the genius room's absolutely on fire at the moment. What should we do? Should we have a word with Lee and then come back to submission number three? I think that'd be a good idea. Should we do that? See what's going on in your wonderful... Oh, it's just, it's just nice to know that somewhere like New Zealand exists, actually. And look look at a picture of health. It's, it's some crazy <laughs> o'clock. What, what, uh, what time of day is it, Lee, with you? No, it's not crazy o'clock. There, there was a time change in the summer hours. Oh. It is... It is 25 to 7. So it's like a re it's, it's daytime. It's like for once I'm not actually getting up in the middle of the night. So that's, I, that's why I'm feeling so positive. I think. Yes. <laughs> You're an inspiration to us all. Let me tell everyone a bit. My people know who you are, but I'm just going to, you know, cover the important points. In any case, multi award winning author editor, three time Bram Stoker award nominee. Um, well, we'll talk about the grotesque thing in a moment. Co-founder, this is a good thing, co-founder of Young New Zealand Writers and of the Wright Murray Residency for Speculative Fiction Writers, and it just goes on and on and on. If you want to learn more about Lee, there's her website. What's all this grotesque monster stuff here? Oh, um, this is a, this is my debut short story collection that came out in July of last year. year last year seems quite a bit of a blur, to be honest. Really? So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm very proud of it and um, really had a lot of fun putting that together. So, um, And it's published by Things in the Well in Australia, um, Little Boutique okay. Company. So and, give us, uh, give us yeah, a little flavour. Give us a little flavour of what... Um uh, yeah, you know, monster come, come stories. <laughs> monster stories, eh? That sounds quite Victorian, actually. It's late Victorian, a bit of Gothic. Um, there's a little bit of everything, but it's mostly New Zealand stories. Or a few, oh. you know, I get a little bit around the world, um, something in the Loire Valley, and uh, um, oh. a little bit of the early, you know, pre pre um, New Zealand, you know, sort of the the time before when before the Maori yeah. lived in New Zealand, and also wow. a Tain McKenna adventure, and yeah, no, I had a lot of fun with this. But I, just looking at different aspects of monsters, because you know, I love dark fiction and monster fiction, so yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to ask you fun. the dumbest question, right? The dumbest mm -hmm. question. That, you would think, you, I, I was on that pop-up submission. This Peter Cox asked me the stupidest question. You know, you think she, she should know better. I'm going to ask you the dumbest question that anyone ever asks a writer. But I want to know, where do you get your ideas from? Um, I steal them and, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I steal them from people. I uh, when, when inspired kids, when they, by. Yeah, no. Yeah. When children ask me this, I, I say I steal, and I exaggerate, and I lie. Um, I do oh. all the things. I eavesdrop. You and know, you get paid for it. Amazing. Not yeah, in jail. Yeah, get, yeah, gets, yeah. gets paid for it. <laughs> lauded. Amazing. So, do you ever give yourself the chills? You know, you sort of wake up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, dead time of night, and this idea either comes to you or it's been with you, and you and it really, really freaks you out. Do you get freaked out? Yeah, I, I don't know about that. It's like, can you tickle yourself? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know that I, you know, I like this. That I like to explore the things that that um, frighten me um, and I and I think mm. that by putting them on the page that is a way of dealing with them in a way right. so, so we are um, your unpaid in fact we pay you but we're your therapist the therapy mm -hmm. yeah exactly exactly wow. yeah are there any areas you wouldn't go because you're dealing with the id monsters from the id yeah no not any yet. areas you wouldn't go no. really no not wow. yet yeah, because that's because you live in New Zealand, you see. We're all watching. Oh, you know, I think so, what you know, strikes us is different. 
is different, you know? Like in New Zealand, we have this tension about, you know, earthquakes and yeah, sure. and, um, and that kind of thing. So what frightens people differs depending on where you live and who you are and, you know, your your experiences. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so, so there's so much to explore there. Yeah, exactly. Well, so, well it would be very nice if you let us in. <laughs> we can't we can't get in the bleeding country lee it's all very well of you to sit there blimey um what's all this then australia horror writers association what's going on here yes this is the it's called uh, the australasian actually um, okay. Peter, and it's yeah. australia new zealand oceania um uh society for um horror writers it's part hmm. it's um it's a standalone society separate of the horror writers association which is the international group um, oh. but this particularly focused on oceania and new zealand australia Oceania, so so there's cthulhu that- sort of sea monsters not from the deep and stuff like that <laughs> yeah got it yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, and every year this group puts out a, 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 um, a, an anthology called Midnight Echo, and this mm. is the 15th year of it, and I was their guest editor this year, so um, I've been involved with the organisation for quite a long time, wonderful, wonderful people, so mm. a great place to explore um, New Zealand and Australian talent, and also sort of in that Pacifica area, yeah. um, it's, and I think, you know, it's nice, it's nice to de- discover new voices. So Definitely. this year, Midnight Echo, I mean, it was a pandemic year and people were writing about their fears and wow, yeah. this, year's, uh, this year's anthology was really hard. It was really hard to select those stories. Some oh, absolutely bet. incredible writers, some of my favourites. You know, so really nice people, Anderson. actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's paradoxical because actually you think of horror writers, you think, oh, Stephen King or something, oh, kind of freaky. Oh, no, they're but, the nicest people. They probably are because what they've done is they, they've ex- exorcised all their demons. Aren't they? And they're just ah, oh, I'm fine. I'm I'm okay now. I got rid of all my. Actually, my we're crap. not fine. Yeah. Most of us are suffering from sort of depression and anxiety. But that's the oh. whole point of horror is to give you hope. So yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that. Um, that's the whole point of horror yeah. to give you hope. What a great quote. Let's have a look at the uh, next submission. We've got time. We come back. Have have more words of mm-hmm. wisdom and wit from Lee. This is our third submission of the day. It's called Life Pager. It's from Deborah. QR code there. It's contemporary fiction. This is Deborah's blurb. When her mother is rushed into hospital, Gemma goes to prop up father, Ken, who doesn't know one end of his dog from the other. It couldn't happen at a worse time. Because Gemma has her own shit to contend with, quite apart from making sure four-year-old Natty is kept alive and upholding other, other? Other, other? What does that mean? I think there's a misprint there. Deborah, sort that out. Other housewifely demands. She's on constant alert to ensure husband Richard's penis doesn't accidentally fall into the vagina. Oh my goodness, I didn't know we were going to go like that. Of his colleague Sam, which happened recently. Well, that took me by surprise. I didn't know we were going to go in that territory quite so soon. But there we are. We've just got demonetized for everybody. So, as I was saying earlier on, if you <laughs> if you don't spread the word about pop-up submissions, YouTube is not going to help us on this. So uh, please tell everyone about us, all right? Let me tell you about um, Deborah. I live in Bath and will soon graduate with a BA Ons in creative writing, something I've been studying for the past six years. Well done. Great commitment. Very impressed. Um, I've been long-listed, short-listed, runner-up, and won various writing competitions. You should name a few, actually. Don't hide your light. I've always written... And Life Paper is about the 10th incarnation of the first book I ever completed nearly 20 years ago. I've had to update the technology a lot, says Deborah. OK, um, this sounds a terrific submission. It's going to get a terrific reading from Chris. The first page. Life Paper by Deborah Cooper. Read by Chris Ugai. It's so quiet in the house. It makes you wonder if this is how her mother might have felt decades ago when she and Miles were at school and their dad was at work. Might Sylvia have felt just as lost, lonely and confused? Typically, in Gemma's childhood flashbacks, her mother is standing at the kitchen sink, the way she is now, staring through the window at the garden beyond, her face expressionless, eyes dark and unreadable. Sometimes Sylvia is wearing marigold gloves, but others she is not, 
because she liked to have something to complain about. So if sore and cracked hands were on the agenda, then she'd absolutely suffer for the cause. There is some twangy 60s music playing on the radio in Sylvia's scenario, and a handy mirror permanently within reach, so that when there was a rap at the door, she could reach for a convenient lipstick and refresh the rambin' rose on her natural permanent pout. Gemma's always been envious of her mother's full lips, more so as she did not inherit them. Of course, in those days, there would have been frequent visitors necessitating the mirror and lipstick. Neighbors popped round with their gossip. Gemma's nan would call in with some groceries, the milkman for his money, the fishman, Jack Foster. She'll never forget him and his stinky white overalls, the alarming gap between his teeth like that old actor, Terry Thomas, and sleek-backed hair similar to Dad's, who winked much too much, and if Gemma happened to be there when he was, would haul her, quite painfully, up under her arms and plonk her on the cold metal draining board before revealing his catch of the day to a delighted Sylvia. In adulthood, Gemma's often wondered how many of these men who so easily lit up Sylvia's eyes had truly been anything other than innocent acquaintances. Gemma serves her own kitchen, discernibly different to the one Sylvia used to stand in. It's big, it's bright, it's now cleaner than it was earlier, but it's never spotless. There is a vase of spring flowers on the table, and sunlight slants through the windows, checkerboard in the walls. Years ago, through her teen dreams of husbands and homes and happily ever afters, she'd placed this particular picture inside her bubble of perfect happiness. She just never imagined being married to the prick that burst it. She checks the clock on the wall above the sink. Maybe she'll call Richard before going to pick Natty up from nursery school. See if he wants to meet for a coffee or something. Or maybe she'll be spontaneous and just call in unannounced. Her palms begin to sweat and her heart rate increases. The idea of doing the latter causes her bowels to constrict. Unannounced. Unannounced. There isn't, or at least there oughtn't to be, anything wrong with this idea. She is Richard's wife. He is her husband. Nat is their daughter. They'd be popping in to see Daddy at work, and it would be lovely, unexpected, perhaps even fun. Now she has an overwhelming urge to throw up. Panic spreads like pinpricks over her scalp, and an image of Sam, Richard's ever-efficient colleague, looms into view. She's crawling out from beneath Richard's huge mahogany desk and wiping her mouth. And there is Richard, behind his desk, in a state of recently orgasmed delight. The sight is followed by a sudden, quite loud, zipping sound, sealing the deal and leaving absolutely no room for doubt. Maybe she won't do either. Call ahead or unannounced. Maybe she needs more time to adjust to this new situation. After all, it's only been a few months since Richard's confession. During which time, he's given Gemma no reason whatsoever to suspect that the affair was anything other than the silly error of judgment he insists it was. Done and dusted. Over and out. Been and gone. So, why can't she feel better about it? Why does she still feel so anxious? Why can't she, as Richard constantly impresses upon her, stop dwelling on it and move on? He's apologized, hasn't he? Many, many times. He can't keep on apologizing for something he can't change. And they're moving on. Together. Aren't they? I rather wonder whether they are, actually, after all that. I say. Yes, well, um... Andy. Oh, I like this, you know. Um, I like the title. I wasn't, I wasn't overly keen on the blurb, not because of the penis thing, but I just thought it was a bit confusing. Yeah. By the second line, I wasn't sure whether the main character was actually a dog, because there was that weird line about the dog. <laughs> well, I think he is a bit. And, stuff, and I was a bit lost. Yeah. Um, and then when it started, we, we had the mother, who was then called Sylvia, and she was Gemma. I just had to... I think that could do, be done better than it than it's been done. Totally. But next, the, the sore and cracked hand giving giving her mother something to complain about for washing up. That's the best thing I've heard all day. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I'm doing this, I write little ticks by by things I like, and I immediately got two ticks. I just thought that's that's just bad. 
really like that. Um, I was a bit uncertain while we were so quickly in the past. I'd like to have a bit more present before we were back in the past the way we were. Hmm. Um, but I thought this was really nicely written. I thought it was really nicely read as well, actually. It was, um, yeah. Thank you, Chris. The prick, like the prick gargle, uh, bubble gag. That's Again, nice. I gave that yes. to you. I thought that yeah. was lovely. Yeah. Um, the, and then we get into this nervousness about the unannounced visit, which led us to Richard's confession. And by the end of it, I just wrote, I'm with her in this. Yeah, I, I was really, yes. the idea that, that her fellows had an affair with his secretary, yeah. who's still there in his life. Yeah. And he's telling her, you know, stop dwelling on it and move on. Yeah. I felt like I'm really with her in her predicament. I care yeah. about her. Yeah. And she's bright and erudite, and I like her. It's so, not going to end well. Oh, all right, it's going to end well, I think, for you, Deborah. Uh, let's get some numbers from you, Andy. Um, it's a definite four. Yeah! Oh, like a man who knows his own mind, Lee. Yeah, I'm going to actually agree with everything that Andy said there. Um, he's pretty much plucked my, my notes just straight off the page there, so that was really good. I, I think the problem is that there's a, a disconnect between that blurb and which and and mm. the actual text. So I was expecting this kind of quirky, chicklety, you know. Um, yeah, me too. Sort of a little bit flirtatious, a little bit silly, you know, like frivolous sort of uh, character to come on. And then we had this very somber reflective character you know really it's it's quite a quite a gray lonely sort of a start to the story so it wasn't at all what the blurb you know set up for us and so yeah. that's a problem because um because when you don't deliver what you set out what you say you're going to deliver then you get mm. this um uh, cognitive dissonance on the part of your reader Absolutely. so yeah so in actual fact i think that kind of let me down because i was expecting this very funny uh, you know cutting kind of story and it, and it is it clearly is going to be but it what the the writing didn't reflect what the blurb had had presented so yeah yeah um I really do. I really did like it. I'm not a. I don't read a lot of literary fiction anymore. But I. I was really. Yes, I was engaged. I wanted to know more about her. This is a really tough one in terms of the numbers because I've given everything else a four today, and I want to give this a four, a five, a four. <laughs> mm, I'm somewhere halfway in between. <laughs> um, because the writing is nice, you know. I mean, I. I think I can see some things that I would that I, as an editor, would go through and say, we could tighten this up. But generally, yeah. I think it's, it's pretty nice writing. So, yeah. Night the voice. I feel engaged. I like the character. So, so yeah, this is a nice piece of writing. I'm waiting on a number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were going to get away with that. Yeah, no, not for me. Look, okay, I'm going to give it a four again. Another four. I'm a, how am I going to define these? I'm going to be stuck at the end of the program, aren't I, I saying know. which one's my favourite? <laughs> exactly, yeah, you are. You know what's happening. You know what's coming. Uh, Kate says, public vote is very split. Twos, threes and fours. More twos than anything else. Uh, Kate, nice. Four is now up there. So, yes, how interesting. Um, Robert says, writing is good with some lovely turns of phrase, nice imagery, intelligent characterization, but it's lacking plot direction for me. Yeah, I, I understand that too. I can see that. I think that... I'm going to mark. I would have said four. I'm going to mark you down, though, Deborah. I think this is this is publishable. I'm going to mark you down because the everyone says that they don't like the blurb. I don't like the blurb. I think it is a slow start. You you know you've got to hit the, hit the ground running. You've re, you've got the first two three pages. Your golden hour. It's a, your calling card for the agent or the the publisher. That's really why we do seven hundred words for seven hundred words. You know just to. To show you, if you can, if you can make it there, you're going to jump out of the submission pile. You will. Um, so, I think it is a slow start. It's a bit meandering. After a page or two, people might might drop out. Publishers or agent might drop out, which will be a shame because I think I think there's lots of potential here. Which is all, you know, by way of saying I was going to go four, but I'm going to go three because you need to improve <laughs> the potential. Um, but you do that, and I think you'll be away. Should we have a look and see what um, what the scores are like? May take a second or two to update Kate. Thank you so much.
for doing this oh no it's all there it's all there Kate is nothing if not up to date so you have just surged into the lead there Deborah despite a very curmudgeonly agent uncommonly so really it's a start of new year should be optimistic and stuff um everyone's given it a four actually having the Deborah apart from me miserable misery guts but you also there with an Aladine touch, Simon, are doing pretty darn well at 65%. And also no more, no more Dragon Sea. We have two more submissions. Shall we have a look at them? Life's too short to tiptoe. There's a title to juggle with. It's romance with an erotic element. I say. It's uh, moving towards that sort of show, isn't it? Eh? It's by Anna. Very complex QR code down there, actually. Very interesting uh, web link. I wonder what it is. This is Anna's blurb. A woman analysing the shit out of a difficult man for who wouldn't want to do over with the one who dumped you. Didn't understand that. I'm going to try that again. A woman analysing the shit out of a difficult man for who wouldn't want a do over with the one who dumped you. Right. I understand that second time round. A man's inner world reflected in a woman's travels. So we're getting a trifecta here, aren't we? Chasing chaos, chasing connection, until COVID carves their world. Okay, well, you already know that I find the blurb a little difficult, but a long way to go yet. This is Anna's um, bio. I'm a psychotherapist in private practice. There are a few women writing about romance with an erotic element for women in their 40s, 50s and beyond. This is my first book. I think you just spotted a market there. And I think we're going to get a very fine delivery indeed from Martin. The first page. Life's Too Short to Tiptoe by Anna. Read by Martin. Drifting into grace. Another damp year. A night behind curtains. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. When she'd hoped for sanded planks beneath bare feet. Mint growing wild under brass outdoor taps. She has yet to turn the lights on. It's as black inside the room as out when she glances at her inbox. Hello, I'm a professor at this medical faculty who happened on your name while I was searching, co researching cognitive therapy and stimulus control as treatments for neuropathy. Could you recommend a study that might be of value? Thank you very much. Sincerely, Max Allen. An almost neutral take as she recognises the name of an ex-boyfriend a short-lived relationship in their twenties. He'd ghosted on her before it even become a fashionable term. Calculating silently, right on target, midlife, a space between departure and nostalgia, she types quickly. Hey, it's me. You must be bored. Are you still hot? She could have added, are you still unavailable, unstable and unreliable? It seems almost predictable gravitating towards old girlfriends once twenty odd years have passed. Doubt and disenchantment pasted across memories of this bad boy, disquieting and ultimately baffling as there hadn't been arguments or unkind words. Just a deep silence. The parts of her she couldn't easily face up to. He could, and feeling rubbish, she'd gone on to travel using unpaid leave. She'd heard that he had headed off to specialise elsewhere, had left the country with relief shedding an earlier life. Yet here it appears that relief had been replaced by something like regret. Curtains cloaking street scenes beyond tall sash window frames, a cup of tea lifted to her lips in the darkened room as she reads his swift reply. Don't know if I ever was hot. You, on the other hand, are as pretty as ever. Nice website. Google me. Those are recent pitch pics. This is an amazing coincidence. I've thought about you often over the years. Backtracking, claiming a con coincidence, not quite. Hoping he'll recognise fifty shades of grey humour, she types rapidly. You had a command that no one else your age had, and amused by the build-up in this teasing, she continues, and an edge which was very attractive. What draws women to these shallow motivations? So it happens time and again. A woman considers long-term relationships with genuine guys, but instead ends up desolate by not-so-nice boyfriends. Evolution could have a part in this. She's less to blame. 
Not so nice boyfriends. They're intriguing. Lightning rods where there are fears of humiliation and rejection. Nice guys aren't going to deliver that jolt of dopamine, that whammy from the gods. They're going to put in effort and care. They're present under the Christmas tree. They're the present under the Christmas tree which hasn't been wrapped. No surprises there. Repeat mistakes. The bad boy, however, could take off with the Christmas fairy, crumpling the wrapping paper on the way out. This indifferent boyfriend had presumably been wrapped in himself. There's a humility in his response. Thank you, but I was also a little jerk. You were up late. Quietly amused by his formality, she responds, I am. I'd be loath to think that the edge had been blunted. Sometimes, as a psychotherapist, she wonders what to make of this endless drive, this pushing back of the years, this fierce becoming at what would once have been the tail end of life. In the absence of a blueprint for these extra years, what to do with these? A swift reply on his part. No, I haven't mellowed much. A lot more political. I've had an eventful life. I'm sure you have too. I can't get over how cute your pictures are. I would want to lie on your couch and tell you about my fantasies. Sunlight only slightly warmer than the surrounding air. In the morning, she glances at his message. Appointments are strictly rotated. I have a caseload of fantasies already. The couches, incidentally, are deep and Freudian. Will it become a reality? Should it become a reality? Maybe yes. More probably, no. So, Lee, does this float your boat? Oh, gosh. Um, I love the title. Um, the blurb I didn't quite understand. Oh. I like the idea of it, the genre, and um, but I don't think the writing was quite there for me yet. Um, I did like the voice of the chap on the other end because he sounded real. Like, I yeah. think I've had that guy send me messages <laughs> on Facebook. And um, so he sounded familiar. Um, but I think there's just a bit too much verbiage, I think, is the word um, in the actual writing. It's a bit it's a bit tally for me at the moment. So I think the actual, the narrator's voice needs work um, at the moment. It's just that little bit too tally. There's just, it's, you don't have to have every word that you know that's cool. <laughs> in the sentence yes. I think it's just a little bit hard for me to fathom um, and I think that's the problem it just needs simplifying and then then I'll get a feel for that for that female character and I just don't yet and actually she's me so <laughs> yeah. I should get her you know yeah. I should I yeah. should get her so and I don't so okay. well no I, I'm not looking I'm not looking for an old boyfriend but having said that <laughs> I should relate to her to we, we, we are learning a lot about you today <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so not yeah, not really engaging me quite so much this one. Okay, so give us a number. A three. Fair enough. Um, Hannah says this feels like the story is moving towards very shallow sex. That turns me off. Okay. Uh, yeah, everyone everyone sort of agrees about the blurb. I think I think what you did there, Hannah, was. Um, I think you were in trouble with the blurb, I think. <laughs> and you thought, I'll go for a trifecta. I go, one, two, three, and oh. Uh, yeah, uh, we do a lot of work on blurbs in Latopia. And I, I think it's fair to say almost every author finds them really hard work. But you've got to do it, because if you don't, someone else is going to do it, and they won't do it as well. What did you think, Andy? <coughs> I, I agree. I like the title. Um, and I agree the blurb is a mess. Um, when we got to the, at least the first email, I was like, oh, I don't quite, this is a bit clunky. But then I thought her response was fun. Um, as it went on, I thought it was interestingly written. Um, I'm not sure about the scenery. I'm not sure about the stuff around the emails. I'm not sure it quite works. The, the idea of like, you're describing the room and all not, but there's this sense of like, where we feel removed. You're giving us backstory, but again, we feel quite removed and i'd have to read it again to figure out for myself why but yeah I, I felt I wasn't yeah quite, I was, it's almost like you were right you were writing in a magazine article about your life rather than telling me what your life was in terms of nice way to put it um yeah but, but, uh, when we got to the dopamine that whammy from the gods <laughs> that was uh, 
I thought the overall the style was kind of clever but a bit confused and I think hence the reader was struggling with it a little bit the, the email exchange ultimately felt very real for me and it was entertaining mm. it was me mm. laugh and yeah. that really makes your last line um, for set your, you know, to, to do 700 words for, for, for this show and come out with a banger at the end I yeah. think in, in a sense you know, deserves a round of applause anyway fantastic so, yeah. yeah excellent alright so let's get a number I, I go for a three okay oh. alright so oh. Yeah. All right. So, mm, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I think I think there's lots and lots of potential in this, um, and I like a lot about it. I think some of the writing is really classy. I think the blurb is awful. I'm not, I'm not, I, I think the title on balance is okay, um, mostly because I've been listening to you know what Lee's saying, what other people say in the chat room. I didn't like it initially, but I have to remind myself slap myself occasionally i'm not actually in the demographic for this so you know i would be in the position of trying to make money out of it without actually really being um, um a potential reader um i think there's a lot going on here that is good i would like to give it a four but you know as people constantly say to me you've got to judge the words you see in front of you not the potential lots of potential but i'm still going to give it three and Hannah carries on and says, I didn't feel the emotion that I'd expect with reading that kind of email from an ex. Very astute, I think, Hannah. Good. All right. Shall we um, have a look at our final submission of the day? No. Uh, dreadful, actually. It's almost over. Isn't that dreadful? Yeah, here we go. It's called The Peregrine Letters. It's commercial fiction. It covers a wide variety of sins, doesn't it, Susanna? And this is Susanna's blurb. Intimate discoveries are made through a DNA test that blows Willa's world apart, juxtaposed with Caroline's unexpected encounters with men. The epistolary story, that means it's told through letters. Kind of, actually, kind of the same as what we've just seen in a funny sort of way. Um, the epistolary story about two divorced biologists is filled with surprise, humour and sagacious witticisms. Oh, I love those. About the ups and downs of life, environmental concerns of modern society and the cherished value of family and friends. That's a lot. All the while, the reader is enlightened about the changing world around us as these women are forced to change along with it. And I'll tell you about the author. Well, we've got Susanna down as the author. She actually is the co-author. Susanna Dent wrote this with her writing partner, Jamie Castell, who's based in L.A. This is Jamie Castell's first epistolary novel. I quite like saying that. Uh, the only other use of that word I've ever come across is St. Paul's epistles to the Ephesians or something like that. Um, her love of nature and societal destruction by overconsumption motivated her character's career and gave voice to environmental concerns which plague us all. Well, I don't really. If they plague more people, then something might be done about it. Susanna Dent is from Great Britain, has lived in St. Petersburg, Russia, which where the river froze yesterday. I haven't known. <laughs> and Los Angeles, USA. A former civil servant, she has a master's in social anthropology from Edinburgh University. Whilst writing this book, Susanna was in the UK and Jamie was in LA. They never picked up the phone once in true spirit of the book. Very good too. Practicing what you preach, and here to give it a jolly good reading is Robert. The first page. The Peregrine Letters by Susanna, read by Robert. Dearest Willa, a distraction for you. Peregrine talk, my speciality. The more we can get these amazing birds into the public ethos, the better. It still surprises me how very missing birds are from the everyday of our environment. They are singing all the time around us, and yet we don't hear them. And even when we decide to mentally tune in and listen to them, they can be extremely difficult to spot, especially when it is raining and they are taking cover. I really noticed this the other day when I led a bird walk over our common land. It was a slow, soft drizzle, the kind that is so weak and soft you can't even really see it. It is just hanging there in the air, this English dampness that pervades your very soul, but lends a beautiful, soft, romantic quality to a walk in the woods that is not there when the rain stops. 
Everything is damp and glistening and vibrant, and the birds are going crazy with song. And yet, did we see a single bird? No, we did not. I had a few newcomers on the walk, and they expressed their most sincere gratitude to me at the end, despite having seen nothing. They said they felt like they had had a layer of skin peeled away from their vision. The world had suddenly taken on a whole new hue, colour, visceral feel that they had never experienced before when they had gone out with the sole purpose on a walk of spotting birds. And because they hadn't seen any, their ears had been on high alert, and they said they had never noticed the birdsong before. A whole new world has been opened up to them. Isn't that marvellous? Isn't that just what life is about? Enabling people to see the world with new eyes, peeling off those layers of crud and dust that accumulate over the years of living in the mire of the everyday. Birds are everywhere, each species singing a different beautiful song, and yet the majority of us hear nothing of those songs and know nothing about the birds. But we know about the birds, though, don't we? Caroline. March 16th, Los Angeles. Oh dear Caroline, right now the only thing about the birds I can think of is their saliva. The swift let swallow builds its home with its saliva, yet somehow, by spitting out saliva for the lab, my home has been slimed. My mother was right. Spitting is bad and always makes a mess. Penny created her destiny by spitting at her fate. Literally, when Penny dribbled saliva into that tiny glass vial, this sticky mess has now happened to us. Carpenter taps to my eyes. A trick I used as a kid to suppress tears didn't work and only encouraged the flow of my warm cascade of tears, streaming snot everywhere, hic hiccuping and making a big goopy mess of myself. I couldn't find a tissue box. I never remembered to buy tissue boxes at the market. Lawn bought those. I had to use my t-shirt as a giant tissue. The upside, because there has to be an upside to everything I've been told, the upside is that repurposed clothing is better for the environment than a paper tissue, although not better for my self-esteem. What could make a grown woman cry? I got the genetic test results of Penny confirmed. How do I say this? I'll say it here in as many ways as I can think of, because I don't know how I can bring myself to say it to you or anyone ever again. Penny is not Lorne's daughter. Penny is someone else's child. Penny doesn't dangle from his family tree. Penny isn't his. And yet, yet he is her father. She is his daughter. She is his life. She is the result of all the love he has poured into her being for 25 years. I know all too well to know that he will refuse to share her with any other father. Lorne's most important role in, it, in life has been changed because of a tiny drop of saliva. How do I tell them the truth without changing, well, everything? Thank you very much, Robert. Gorgeous reading. Um, we've got Rob in the chat room today, Junior's room, so it's always great actually to hear from the readers themselves and the writers because they kind of see it a slightly different way. They get inside it. And incidentally, we don't ask them to, to read specific texts. They choose them. They choose them. So they presumably choose what they like. And um, Robert says, I like the idea. This is a good comment, this. I like the idea. And by having two different authors, it does bring two different voices to the characters. However, it could be tighter, which is difficult because letters can often be rambling. The use of language is nice, though, and it sounds like an intriguing project. Lee? Yes, all of that. Yes. <laughs> all right, fine. Thank exactly. you, Lee. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm familiar with collaborative writing. I have a collaborative series with Dan yeah. Raybart's, um so I do know what that's like and and it actually it's interesting because collaborative writing you think you're only writing half the book but it actually takes twice the amount of time I because bet it you does. actually do have to communicate with your co-author yeah. so what happens page. if you don't agree 
on something. What happens? Oh, well, you see, in the case of Dan and I, I'm the big sister person. I write the big uh, sister character, and I'm the big sister in our writing team, if you it. like. And so yeah. what I say goes. You oh. know? <laughs> That's easy. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> He's scared of me. But also, the other thing is that I'm a scientist, so the themes of this appeal to me. So, um, but but it just feels didactic to me, and I love the I love the um, epistolatory approach to it because it does give you two distinct voices, hmm. which is kind of what Dan and I have tried to do. So we what we've done with our series is is it here? Oh, um, this okay. is the last one in the series. Is we've done a sort of he said she said. So I write one character and he writes the other character so a similar sort of thing to this hmm. but you but we both writing both characters because of course the story they're together um but but i think but i think here the, the idea was to have two distinct voices the problem is that you don't have them doing the same things there's no there doesn't seem to be yeah. a plot line featured through yeah. here i think it yeah. can work but it just needs some work it does, um, it does, just, yes. Yeah. So yeah, that's fantastic. I, that, yeah, I didn't know that you, of course, you've got that, that background, that experience, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. You speak from experience. Uh, give us a number. Yeah, I'm going to give this a three. And bordering towards a two, so sorry. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> We were lucky to get in there. I think another couple of minutes, uh, Susanna, and she might have gone for a two. Ooh, we don't want that, do we, in the first show of the year? Andy. Um, so, so look. Obviously, you come on this show and you can only give your opinion. Yeah. Um, and obviously, my opinion is is no better than anyone else's, as you can tell by my complete lack of knowledge when it comes to speculative fiction. Um, <laughs> but Let's not open that wound again. That was bruising enough. There's blood all over I, the carpet <laughs> still. I need to read up. Um, but, but I, I really struggled with this. Um, Peregrine Letters, I think, is fine as a title. The blurb, we've had worse blurbs today, but I didn't think it was great. Sticking sagacious witticisms in your blurb, it just feels like you're showing off. And I yeah. don't think you need that in your blurb. I think you need to tell us what the story's about. I yeah. don't think that's the place yeah. for that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I, and this is what I'm saying the personal thing. I struggle with people putting their politics front and centre mm. of, of the work in the way you did. You, you told us what your politics were when you talked about who you were as a person and we got into the book and straight away you were telling me what your politics were again frankly i agree with your politics but yeah. in in this sort of thing it just to me it reads self-indulgent yeah. and pre and I, I just and it turns me off yeah. and, and to be honest you know if, if you're talking about like you know like you know going to the accountant and shagging the tax man and you know, being right wing it would turn me off <laughs> <laughs> A left wing one, you think I just feel like I'm being lectured, and, and I, I'm not. I'm not keen on it. Um, yeah, yeah. And then we went into the weather, which which again isn't great. And then and then there's a start, which, which is a really nice line. They felt like they had a layer of skin peeled from their vision. Hmm. That that's great. Like that line. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. In the yeah. of the letter, it just sounded like the guy's showing off. It yeah. sounds like I took some people from a bear watching today, and they thought I was a dog bollocks, basically. Is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, Nicely so put. I like the way you put it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't equate really me to, to your character, unfortunately, or your writing. Um, yeah. um, you know, uh, when we got to Penny, and 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 I, and I started figuring out the way we're the reason we're talking about spitting is because of the DNA aspect of the story. I thought one, once I'd figured out myself, I thought, well, that's interesting. Mm. Well, I think perhaps that's what this should be about rather than yeah I didn't think we really got into the story actually I mean there's the story in the blur but we you know this is Barbara said I think it's scrolled off the screen now but I noticed what Barbara said she said this letter is a prologue and it is it is I smelt it I could tell it I can tell a prologue a mile off it was a prologue don't try and pull the wool over my eyes I am prologue finder general <laughs> um, so yeah I, I just I think it's a potentially interesting story but I don't feel it kicked in there and it's quite interesting I mean, just going to go back to Leah again for a moment because, you know, she's done this. She's done this. She's been there. She's done that. There's great beauty pop-ups. So 
if you have you know two people working like this is there the danger this is a loaded question because i've got an answer to it is there the danger that you can kind of ramble a bit and one person goes off to one place and another person goes off to another place and the story doesn't really advance oh, yeah um well i guess you know the, the biggest thing about collaborative writing in the sense is to choose your partner very carefully yeah. you know um so i already loved dan's writing he writes with lots of flair and um you know the you know we have we were we wanted to write something that um was relevant to both of us that was set in new zealand so we already were on the sort of same page you know we liked yeah. sort of fast moving narratives so that helps that and i really think that knowing your collaborator really well and the kind of writing they they like and they, they, you know, so we already had that. Yeah, so you and trust think, each other, basically. You know, so but do you, on, what I'm record. wondering is, do you have a structure? Do you have a plot, a skeleton? And you say, I'm going to do this bit, and you do the fourth vertebrae, <laughs> and you'll do the sixth. Do you look like that? Or is yeah, it more, no, you know, no, inspirational? No, not for this, not for collaborative. So we have a general idea of this is where the story is. This is the general story arc. Mm hmm and then I write a scene and then Dan writes a scene and then I write a scene and then Dan. so so that's how okay. we do it and I write my character's voice and he writes his character's voice but we're telling wow. the same story yeah um and so it's always a surprise to open the chapter and think oh my god he's done an explosion and now that's my nice. character who's the scientific <laughs> character has to work out how the hell that happens because he's writing the kind of magical realism and I have to write the real world part of it Fantastic. so it's really yeah. really fun so i don't really know where it's going and it's always moving and i think hmm. that's the problem here it's not it's not moving yeah it doesn't feel like it's moving at the moment. It's no. Here. there's no there's no plot um, yeah so i think that's, so that's right yeah. Yeah. yeah so andy we need a number from you please um it's a two for me it's a two from andy yeah i thought that was coming i could feel that coming i'm going to go i this january one night i'm going to give three but I don't feel that I, it's an interesting idea. I don't feel the story's really started. I need some story, please. That's what I sell. I tell story, and people buy story, and that's wonderful. That's what makes the uh, the business go round. Um, let's have a look at the scoreboard. And my vote is just going to go up in a moment. Andy has. Yeah, Andy's there with a the two. I'm there with a the three. It's all quite tightly bunched today, isn't it? Actually. Um, but that's, that's how it stands at the moment, until we give our two wonderful guests a final chance to, to uh, uh, modify, ameliorate, exaggerate, exacerbate their votes. It looks like uh, Deborah's life pager is up there, together with joint seconds at the moment, with Simon and Anna. But uh, they could all change. These are today's fabulous submissions. And this is the fabulous Andy. You've seen them all now, Andy. Do you want to change anything? Um, no, I think life paper was definitely the best for me in the last five. I don't think it's quite a good fight for us to do. Okay. So you are sticking where you are, Lee. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm going to have to stick with where I am. I think Life Paper was definitely the best. It's sort of slightly edging ahead of No More Dragons. I think with No More Dragons, I'm I'm hoping there's more. You know, like I think that that's yeah. the first section and I'm, I think that the next narrator could be, you know, I think, you know, I'm looking for the potential in it rather yeah. than seeing what's I on know. the page. I know, um, Fat fatal mistake. Yeah. You, go, you go bust as a publisher. But I yeah, do it exactly. too. I do it too. Yeah. So it's time for you now to decide. You've seen what our, our fabulous experts and our fabulous genius room have decided to do, and that's give Deborah's life pager the edge. Don't know if it's going to stay like that. Totally up to you. You've got six and a half days to go to uh, Latopia.com and click on the vote button, and let's just go through and vote basically that's what you do it's not not silly it's not stupid you won't get the president of the united states demanding a recount i don't think um thank you so much lee murray thank you the fabulous andy and his cat phoebe the genius is in the genius room the team behind the scenes so you don't see but without them wouldn't be possible that is kate rachel and Emily, and of course our amazing narrators, who you have heard. 
don't forget to vote. Don't forget to leave a comment on YouTube and do spread the word as well on YouTube, please. If you don't, no one will know about it and wouldn't that be a tragedy? We'll see you next Sunday. Take care. Cats and words, callous words Trying to drive a wedge between us Lonely mornings, secret codes I just gave up keeping this code Slander or liars Nothing can stop us, baby This is a time Canada pounding in